Hey, welcome everyone to the first visitation lecture this year. I'm Alex Lex, I'll be your teacher. Uh, I'm excited to see so many of you here. Um, so, this lecture today, I'll give you kind of a brief introduction on what visitation is, what we'll be talking about, uh, which the technology we will be using, and then we talk a little bit about course logistics. I like to, like everybody here probably is somehow related to computer science or computing. Um, so I, I like to start like my talks usually with this quote. The purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. So we're, like if we run an algorithm to calculate something, we don't want to get the numbers, we want to get something actionable out of it, some result out of it. And so I think this is like largely indis indisputed and Richard Hamming is one a famous computer scientist. And if you take this quote and only modify it slightly, you can say the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. So this class is going to be about making pictures and images and how we display it, but we don't make it to make it just pretty or we, we don't, like the goal of this class is not to produce figures that would come on a magazine cover. The goal of this class is really to create pictures and interactive visualizations, mainly interactive visualizations, then it enable people to gain insights. So here is a counterexample. Um, so like here we have six different plants. What do you think these plants have, <coughs> what do they have in common? Yeah. What's that? They're edible, right? They're important food plants. They all have fancy Latin names. And geneticists are interested in understanding their ancestry, like how are they related to each other, which are the genes that play a role in them. And so people have like to understand how these, gene, how these plants are related, we could look at the genes and we could look at how the genes of this plant are related. And so here's a figure that somebody honestly came up with and published in Nature. And I guess you all have heard of Nature, which is kind of like the most prestigious scientific journal. And that's the figure. That's what I call a banana Venn diagram. <laughs> So it's a six-set Venn diagram of the banana genome as related to these five other plant species. This is like a terrible visualization. It serves no purpose uh, of data understanding at all. It's mainly like really just eye candy for making your article look better. Let's take like, a moment to look at why this figure is so terrible. So here, up here, we have this tiny intersection on the left that shows you 1,151 shared genes. And then right next to it, this intersection here has exactly the same number of pixels. It's, it, show, it, it looks like it's, it would be equally important, but it only contains 40 genes. So there's no proportionality between relevance, the size of the data, and the pixels on this image. It is terribly hard to trace like, which things go together. Like here, for example, you have a segment with 105 genes. Uh, gigantic representation on the figure, like, but really unimportant if you think of it in a, in a global picture. So, and any of you, like, take a look at this chart again. Um, take a second and think about which intersection is this? Which plants are intersected here? So it's basically impossible to do it unless you sit down and trace with a pen to really see what is going on. So this is like a figure that actually triggered me to start a research project that was published in a paper on how we can do this better. We'll talk about this sometime later, but this is just the kind of example uh, that, that we don't want to do in this class. So, if you look in a regular dictionary, not in like a computer science or internet uh, dictionary, if you uh, look for visualization, like the first thing that comes, um, that you will see is something like a form formation of mental or uh, visual, visual images. So I'm visualizing myself having won the Olympics, for example. Um, or it could also be the arc, act, or process of interpreting in visual terms or putting into visible forms. These are the dictionary definitions and they're somewhat related to visualization, but they're not the definition that we will be using. So we use this definition. Visualization is the process that transforms abstract data into interactive graphical representations for the purpose of exploration, confirmation, or presentation. So this sentence essentially contains everything that is important to visualization. So we have a process, we take data, and we make it somehow visual. Um, and not only like visual, it's not only a graphical representation, but it's also an interactive graphical representation. And I will go into detail why interaction is important um, in, a, in a future lecture. Um, and then 
these three different purposes, exploration, confirmation, and presentation, are also important. If you, like, the, the two extremes are exploration and presentation, and those are two very different goals. Uh, presentation is, for example, something that the New York Times would do. They have a data set, they curate it, they really think about what they want to tell you. Um, exploration is something that a scientist would want to do. Like, you are looking at a big plot of data and you want to understand what's going on. So good data visualization is really about making data accessible. Like, we can look, we can have gigantic tables, but they're not accessible. It's about really making data accessible, and it's about combining the strengths of humans and computers. That's also like a very essential concept. It's not, we're not in an algorithms class or a machine learning class where we'll just get an answer. It's about leveraging what humans know and combining it with com what computers can do. It's about enabling insight and it's about communicating. So, um, Stuart Card, who is a famous visualization researcher and also a human computer interaction researcher, uh, said, visualization is really about external cognition, that is how resources outside the mind can be used to boost the cognitive capabilities of the mind. So what he means by that is, by drawing something, by plotting something, we can essentially like, make it more tangible for us. We don't have to memorize everything. We can find patterns and so on. So it's, it's this like, externalization that makes it easier for us to understand. So I mentioned this, um, communication versus exploration. But it's really about informing humans. So for example, who is ahead in the election polls would be like an information or communication aspect. But if you would like to do something uh, exploratory, uh, it would be what is the structure of a terrorist network? You don't have like one very specific question, but you really want to understand how are these people connected? Or which drug can help patient X? I have like a large um, test array of um, blood tests of specific patients, I have knowledge about various different drugs, I, I know about how do they connect, that's an exploratory process. And so here are two different charts uh, that are on the opposite ends here. Like, I'm not going to go into detail on this here, but this is a cancer subtype visualization technique that I developed um, that essentially shows you five different data sets, how they correlate, it's, mixed, uh, it's, it's a mixed approach that uses also machine learning and so on. Uh, and here on the right is, is, is a chart that is really designed purely for communication. So this was done by uh, the Obama administration when he was up for the re-election in 2002. And what he was showing is like job loss um, and job gain under Bush and then under Obama. And so he's telling you essentially, oh, everything went downwards under, under Bush and everything went upwards under, under Obama. And so this is the kind of communication they're doing here. Notice, for example, there's a couple of smart things going on in this chart. They could have flipped it around. Uh, but in this case, it would look like, oh, it's going upwards under Bush and downwards under Obama. They didn't do that. They're like showing upwards under Obama. So this kind of communication things play a role here. Uh, here's another example of communication. Um, I don't know who of you guys is into football. Um, I'm not particularly, but I still saw this, saw this chart and found it interesting. So Peyton Manning is a quarterback who had a um, record in touchdown passes, uh, 510, and this visualization shows you why it's going to be hard for anybody to beat his record. Um, so we can click on this here, and we'll open up this example. Um, and so what we see here is an interactive chart in the New York Times. We'll have a lot of New York Times examples in this class. Um, and so this is not only a data visualization, somebody has curated it, and it's highlighted the important people like you can see, not every player here is highlighted. I can hover, and it's going to be highlighted. But somebody else has made an editorial decision which players are relevant to always show. Um, and so this is like a very classical example of communication. So there's also a very careful color palette. Um, the gray ones are inactive, so they will, have never, will never have a chance to actually beat him. Um, the blue ones are active, and you can see that the trajectory of the blue ones isn't quite as good as his was and so therefore it's going to be hard to beat for them. Um, so here is this uh, cancer subtype example. Um, what this does here is it shows you like um, gene expression data, like the uh, copy number alteration of one specific gene, and then the survival data of, uh, of these patients. And so like, the most important plot here is to understand is like here these patients, like um, the height of this block corresponds to a number of patients, here, like we see most patients are in this block and very few are in this block. So this here means 
Um, these patients here have like additional copies of a specific gene. These patients have many, many additional copies of this specific gene. And so what we're doing here is we're correlating it with clinical data, in this case survival. So this is like a, uh, not a nice data set, it's about a glioblastoma multiform, a brain tumor. Uh, and what we have here is um, the percentage of people that are alive on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So every time this line ticks down, somebody has died. And so understanding these kinds of charts is important. Uh, and so what we do here is we uh, divide these patients up according to whether they have an increased number of genes. Um, and what we can see here is that if you have like a normal number of genes, this curve is much flatter, whereas if you high, have a high number of those genes, this curve is pretty narrow. And we can look at this in, in detail, so we can see like here, low level or high level amplification, the outcomes are really bad. So after roughly two years, only 40% of those patients are alive. Um, but if you have um, the other type of this cancer, this is a normal <coughs> copy number level of this particular gene, um, you can see that you have a much better chance, like 65, 70% are still alive after two years. But these are the kinds of exploratory tasks that we will be uh, looking at in this class. So why do we use graphics? Why not just numbers, text, communication, speech, or whatever? Well, graphics, like our visual system, has the most bandwidth of all of our senses. Like, we can see a lot of information at the same time. We cannot hear so much information at the same time, or at least we cannot pick it apart as easily. Our tactile senses, our smell, and our noses, our taste, and so on, are also not the best senses to uh, take in a lot of data. Uh, so figures are also richer. They provide more information with less clutter, clutter and in less space. They provide this what's called the Gestalt effect, and we'll be talking about Gestalt principles. Uh, they make structure visible. Uh, they are accessible, they are faster to graphs, they are more memorable, and they are also fun and less formal. It's like, we like pictures and we like to look at them, um, and it's easy to remember them. So here is an example. Um, I don't know whether you guys know the magazine New Yorker. New Yorker doesn't do visualizations, it doesn't do graphics. So what they had to do here is they were talking about a map, about a picture, and I want to read this to you. Um, he then switched to an identically constructed map, only this time based on 2010 census data. And in bits and pieces on the screen, there was simply an arresting picture of what Katrina meant, like is this about Hurricane Katrina. In the neighborhoods that were once a dense black, many of the little squares had thinned and turned gray. The sharp lines that once separated the teapot from Central City were now blurry. The white areas of the city were pushing north into the vacuum left by the exodus. The bywater was graying and it um, gentrified still further. Before Katrina, an American community survey estimated of New Orleans parish population was 455,000 and about 68% black. Now the last estimated 384,000 and so on. So this is like a really long and complicated paragraph that could have been done in a single picture and could have been done much better. <coughs> uh, so there is place for text, there is a lot of place for text, there is a lot of place for stories, and for explaining, for looking at numbers, uh, but if there is a good reason to use a picture, it's usually better to do so. There are good reasons not to visualize. For example, um, if you have a really well-defined question on a well-defined data set. So if you want to ask in a biology case, which gene is most frequently mutated in this set of patients. I can run an algorithm, I'll get the answer, I'll know that and I'll be happy. Or I could ask, what is the current unemployment rate? I don't, if I don't care about the history and how it developed, if I only care about the number right now, I don't need a visualization. And then, visualizations also imply the human factor. There is a person involved. So, high speed decisions are not the right thing to do for visualization. So, high frequency stock trading, if you were trying to do this, using visualization, you will certainly lose. Also, if you do something like um, um, checking whether a bottle is broken, I wouldn't develop a user interface that shows me that this bottle is broken here. This needs to be an automated process. We need to get this out of the assembly line, essentially. So there is a lot of space for automatic solutions, but there is the complicated and interesting questions where visualization can help. Um, and so, like I mentioned, this is about, like, I see visualization really as, like, human data interaction. Um, and so, there's always this uh, aspect of a computer in visualization. And so, this chart is kind of an illustration of where a computer is good and where a human is good. Computers are way better than we are at storing information. Like, if you have a big matrix with a million cells, 
you're not going to remember it. The computer is not going to have any issues. All the numerical calculation, searching, finding, and so on, are really things that are great, uh, like easy to do in a computer. Logic is somewhere in between, but then if you get into comp like bringing in common knowledge, bringing in ca uh, creativity, bringing in cognition, where like soundly it's human domain, where computers are still very bad. Also both for planning, diagnosis, and prediction. Um, computers are getting better in that space, but still the performance of the human is usually um, important in important decisions. So why not, for example, draw stuff by hand or use Illustrator to render whatever you would be interested in? Well, sometimes it can be infeasible um, just because of the scale of things. It's also inflexible. Like, let's say um, I draw whatever uh, a table and if, I, if the numbers change, if something turns out to be false, I would have to update it. And that's also like, a, that's not a problem of drawing by hand, but it's also like infographics are commonly done by Illustrator. But then if somebody makes a mistake or if something is updated, it's really tedious to, uh, to update this chart. Also like if you have data, like an MRI scan um, to visualize and to understand, this is something that is really almost impossible to do in any other way than to use computer-based visualization. Um, interaction is a key concept in visualization. It allows you to drill down into the data. It gives, like, you start from an overview, you find something interesting, and you drill down. Now here is an example of an interactive <coughs> technique of a hierarchy. So, like, um, this circle here represents a hierarchy, and then you can see, like, by clicking on any of those segments, you pop out another element, uh, and that is shown to you in much more detail. This is a sunburst technique for tree visualization, and we'll talk about this uh, in more detail, so you don't have to understand it right now. But, um, the, the idea here is really just to show you, by drilling down, I can find the more important things. By interacting with the visualization technique, I can access a large number of data items. And then, of course, there's integration. Like, visualization nowadays is not isolated drawing pictures. It's usually deeply integrated with algorithms, with machine learning, with statistics. Um, it's about making visualization part of a data analysis pipeline. Um, of course, efficiency, reuse charts, method for different data sets, the quality of a rendering, like we can do precise and data-driven and reliable rendering, and we can use time. Uh, we have an interactive screen, we can, we can do storytelling. So here's an example, like a nice example of storytelling. Let me see, I hope the audio works. One of the most dominant closers in history. is one of the most dominant closers in history. But what may be most remarkable is that he has done it by confounding hitters with mostly one pitch, his signature cutter. John Flaherty of the Yes Network faced Rivera as a hitter and also caught him when he played for the Yankees. From a hitter's standpoint, he's out on the mound. It feels like he's not even putting any effort into it and the ball explodes on you. And from a catching standpoint, uh, he's the easiest guy ever to catch because he throws the ball right where you want it. Rivera uses a seemingly effortless delivery, which he can flawlessly repeat pitch after pitch. His cutter is thrown very much like a fastball, but the pitch has significant lateral movement. He creates and adjusts this movement with the different pressure he puts on the ball with his fingers. The pitch's lateral movement keeps it off the bat's sweet spot, moving in on the hands of a left-handed batter and toward the end of the bat of a righty. To a hitter, Rivera's cutter first appears like a straight fastball, making it hard to distinguish the two pitches during the first fractions of a second when the hitter must decide if, when, and where to swing. Hitters often rely on reading a pitch's spin to determine what pitch is coming, but Rivera's fastball and cutter have what appear to the hitter as the same spin. Many pitchers throw their cutters more like sliders, with their fingers pulling down on the side of the ball. This can create more downward and lateral movement than a cutter, but it also creates the signature spin of a slider, a spinning red dot that the hitter can recognize and adjust to. With identical deliveries and spins on Rivera's pitches, hitters are at a loss to identify and then attack the pitch until it is too late and the balls end up in very different locations. Here are the nearly 1,300 pitches that Rivera threw in 2009, each frozen at the point when the batter must make his swing decisions. But with few clues to determine the pitch's ultimate location, the batter can be faced with guessing at these outcomes. Here are the cutters to left-handers. 
Here are the cutters to right-handers and fastballs to right-handers. He throws almost no fastballs to lefties. As this map of his 2009 pitches shows, Rivera is remarkably adept at hitting the corners, keeping the ball away from the middle of the plate, the easiest spot for a batter to make good contact. Looking from this perspective, it's not surprising that the real hot spot is inside on a lefty. I think he could hit that spot with his eyes closed. Rivera's simple but effective formula has made him baseball's most dominant closer. So, that's like something that you can do in a computer that is highly animated, where you can tell exciting stories. We're not going to do like 3D realistic renderings like this, uh, but we will be looking, for example, at these heat maps that you saw of where the balls hit. So, why not just use some kind of statistics? Why can we not simply like calculate the answer to everything? Um, well, uh, visualization really helps us to ground our decisions. So here is what's known as ANS Compus Quarta, a famous data set that is used to illustrate the point uh, in statistics. We have four different data sets here, both with two dimensions X and Y. And if we look at those data sets and do some descriptive statistics on it, we'll find that these four data sets are <coughs> identical up to like two points beyond the comma um, according to these measures. So they have X has the same mean, Y has the same mean, the variance of X and the same variance of Y is the same, the correlation uh, X, Y is the same, and the linear regression is the same. So like, if you just look at the numbers, those four data sets are essentially identical. This is what, what happens if we plot them. So we can see that these are very, very different data sets. And so if you look at this one, this is probably what you expect. There's like a linear correlation, but it's not very strong. Like here we have this very clear nonlinear correlation. Here we have like a very clear linear correlation with one outlier. And then here we have another linear correlation uh, with uh, one significant outlier. So these, these figures are really telling you like there's something that you need to look at before you do statistics. And then, of course, there's data. Like, visualization is really only interesting when we talk about data. And so, like, I like to think of visualization as part of this data science and data exploration process. So, like, we have the real world, we collect raw data, the data is then processed, the data is then cleaned, and then we go into exploratory data analysis. So, we look at the data first to see what it looks like, what it behaves like. Uh, and from there on out, we can go into machine learning, into algorithms, into some kind of statistical process, statistical modeling. And then we also want to communicate our results and visualize the results and report the findings and then either make decisions or we could also say, okay, I'm just going to build a data product. And so this is like a more complex setup. And if you're, for example, in the data track or in the data certificate, um, you will have lectures that are correspondent to many of those blocks. Uh, this lecture really is about those two blocks here. It's like exploratory data analysis and communication, visualization, and reporting findings. And you'll find other lectures that deal with the other blocks. We'll do a bit here, but not very formal. Um, data is like really everywhere. We have in 2010, um, it was estimated that there is roughly 1,200 exabytes stored somewhere on the world. And this is largely unstructured. So the majority of this is um, videos, images, photos on your computer text and so on. So not really tables or graphs and so on, not, not super structured data. Google is estimated in 2013 to have stored about 10 exabytes of data. And the hard disk industry ships about 8 exabytes per year. And this is like, if I tell you 8 exabytes, it sounds easy to understand it is not. Um, so it's like if you think of 15 exabytes in punch cards, and punch cards are kind of the last data item we as humans can really understand because like we have these paper representations and the whole means of one and then not a whole means a zero, essentially. And if you were to store 15 exabytes in punch cards, you could actually cover all of Massachusetts under 4.5 kilometers of punch cards. Like this is the volume of data that we're talking about. And that's more than the ice sheet was high uh, in the last ice age over. Massachusetts, and this is like from XKCD, this comic. We have so much data even about seemingly trivial things, like if you look for YouTube cat videos, you will find there's 593 million uh, cat videos in YouTube. The data is simply everywhere. Um, so if you think about it, in one single second on the internet, this, this, this is a nice visualization slash illustration. So in one second on the internet, there is like 
this many Reddit votes, this many Instagram photos added, this many Tumblr posts, this many Skype calls, like in one second, this many tweets, this many Dropbox files uploaded. Again, still in one second. Then we have Google searches. <laughs> YouTube videos viewed. So, scrolling Facebook likes. <laughs> Still scrolling. And then finally, there's an extra button for email. So, like, this is endless. <laughs> And in this, like, while I was doing the scrolling here, 50 seconds have passed. So 50 times as much has already happened again in the last 50 seconds as I've just shown you. Just to give a sense of like, how much data is being generated. I'll give you a couple of examples of where data is generated nowadays. So this is personal data. Everything that you see here is data that was collected by my phone, me carrying it around. So here, for example, is I did a bike ride on the weekend. Uh, going from Rudy Hartsman Pass down the Wasatch Trail with my mountain bike. Um, my phone collected everything that I did, where, where I went, what the elevation was, I also took a picture here, it knows all of that. So it does all of that and it shows this to me in a, like in a nice, accessible fashion. And I can essentially see how did I do compared to my previous rides there, uh, can I improve my training, and so on. This was voluntarily, I really switched Strava on to track this. Everything else that you see here is also personal data, but I didn't switch anything on. So this is all the places that I visited in the last two years. You can go to accounts.google.com and look at your profile if you have an Android. Uh, you can see where, where, have you been, where you've been. Every time you switch on your phone, uh, a log file entry is made. Um, this is like one particular day. So Google can actually tell when I go to lunch. Um, if I like, take a lunch break and walk over to the union, Google knows that. It knows where, where I walk, it knows where I eat. Uh, so like everything here is captured. Uh, and you can see like there is like uh, in, in this one day, this was around noon, I had about 123 interactions with my browser that Google had blocked. So there's this massive amount of data on a personal level being uh, collected. It's not only about Silicon Valley products, it's also about science and engineering. Um, so for example, cheap sensors like imaging have changed the way science and engineering is done. Like nowadays, many, many scientific disciplines are, like, for example, moving from a wet lab or like an in the field science to a computing based science. So we have large physical experiments and observations. We have cheaper and automated gene sequences. We have smart buildings and smart cities. So for example, there is this Salt Lake City startup company, Blinsky. They create sensors and that they put on traffic lights. And whenever you walk by, you don't have to do anything other than having your phone switched on. They notice that there's somebody, and they know that they have tracked you like, um, before. They can build a profile of where you've been, and you wouldn't believe there's like many of those sensors in Park City. They want to understand where people go on Sundance. They want to understand where people park, how they can optimize the flows, and so on. So like, this is really happening, and it's happening now. Um, then we have things like you probably all have heard of Moore's Law. Moore's Law essentially tells us how many transistors we can pack on a chip. And uh, this has been essentially exponential growth. And if we superimpose <coughs> Moore's Law with the cost of genome sequencing, the cost per megabase of DNA sequencing, you can see that the cost decrease uh, in comparison to uh, the computing decrease in, in genome sequencing uh, was even more rapid. So it's now so extremely cheap to sequence the genome that it's going to be in a couple of years like a standard way of doing diagnostics. And it even goes into a, um, in a controversy um, of do we do still like classical uh, scientific method, we have a hypothesis, we, we collect data to test that hypothesis, and then we either verify or reject the hypothesis. We can now do data-driven methods. We can simply look what is in the data without having a hypothesis. And I'm not saying this is good, there's a lot of problems with that. There's spurious correlations and so on, but we can do it. At CERN, the Large Hadron Collider, you can actually go to this link and download 300 terabytes of data uh, from that link um, to essentially get all of the data that uh, the Large Hadron Collider has collected. Um, and so here are just a couple of examples of how much data this is. This would be roughly 80,000 um, 
Blu-ray discs or DVD-Rs, sorry, uh, 6,000 uh, Blu-ray discs. It's like this is just an immense data set and you can really just download it. Genomics, I already mentioned that before. We have these sequencing machines. We have services like 23andMe that do personalized genome analysis. Uh, we have, this is a genome sequencing machine. You can actually plug it into your computer and like put a sample on it and it will actually sequence your genome. Um, like it's this size, we can collect this kind of data now. Um, and here is something that's called a high throughput screening machine. Like there is what, we, this is really data driven discovery. This is what pharma companies use nowadays to test whether the compound has a specific effect on a cell. So they have a big array of compounds, they maybe have like 100,000 chemical compounds that they want to test, and they simply try all of them. They, they try and see how it affects the cell, and this machine does this automatically. They take a picture, then they describe the morphology of a cell, and we can capture that. So we, can, we don't have to have a hypothesis, this, this compound could actually work to treat this, we can just try them all. And then there is, of course, like intelligence. The NSA, Utah Data Center, it's pretty, like nobody knows very much about it. This is a picture from the internet, so don't really believe it's exactly like this. Uh, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Uh, but <laughs> I don't believe this is a, like a generated like picture. But anyways, uh, <laughs> so like, just think about the storage cap capacity. There is different estimates, but Forbes magazine estimates they store about 12 exabytes in this Utah data center. Like just to give you an idea about the volume of the data. So um, the ability to take the data, to be able to understand it, to process it, to extract value from it, to visualize it, to communicate it, that's going to be a hugely important skill in the next decades because now we really have essentially free and ubiquitous data. That's from Google's chief economist. And so data is really changing so much in our lives right now. Um, and, and visualization and the other data science disciplines like machine learning and statistics are really at the heart of it. So this is kind of like my pitch, why you should be in this class. And now I'll tell you a little bit about um, how we got there, like how visualization actually started. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about cave paintings, um, <laughs> but this is essentially like people were externalizing things that they saw and, and, and essentially communicating them in some ways. Um, and then, like, later we have these visual representations that could either be songs or we have geometric representations or we have depictions in books. Um, and then, like, the first data visualizations were maps. So this is like a, a, a map of a Turkish village. It's believed to be one of the oldest maps in existence. It's about 6,200 before Christ. And here is another map where you can see, like if you look closely, it's an unfamiliar projection, but you can see this is the Mediterranean, here's Italy, here's Europe, and this is about 550 before Christ. So like, these are really early examples of, of, of maps, which are also visualizations. And then uh, we had books by, for example, Leonardo da Vinci that were just depicting a reality that wasn't easily accessible, like muscular structure or, or skeletal structure, or um, Galileo Galilei drew the moon how it looked like, or people drew plants. Essentially, making stuff accessible, making things tangible. Um, and this is like a famous um, picture slash video, picture set slash video by uh, Edward Muybridge. And like this is a fascinating story. In the 1840s, um, people weren't sure when a horse is galloping that do all of his four hooves leave the ground at the same time. So nobody really knew. And there were like hot discussions in. Uh, in the gentlemen's clubs back then. And so some people like, try to um, find evidence for, for how, like, whether a horse actually, uh, all of the four legs of the horse leave the ground. And so they devised this like, um, camera setup where cables triggered cameras, and then they created this photo study and actually showing that the horse does indeed leave the ground with all of the four hooves. And so now a completely tangential story, this guy who recorded that was also like a little bit of a hothead and he found his wife cheating um, one day and then he actually shot uh, the guy and the interesting part about this is that he was acquitted for justifiable homicide. <laughs> <laughs> he first tried an insanity plea, it didn't work out, uh, but he, like the jurors saw, okay, that, I get it, that's totally understandable. <laughs> um, so here we have planned, uh, like a planned movement diagram, diagram from around 950. 
um, wind maps um, were, of course, very important for seafaring nations. Like we see, um, is this illustration is hatching where the major wind uh, is, um, so that you can essentially plan how you would um, navigate. And then around 1700, we started to see representations of abstract data. So up to this point, everything you've seen here was like something spatial, like um, medical renderings, maps, and so on. But then um, by, by 1700, we started to see these abstract representations of data. Um, and so here we have William Playfer, here, who was an early um, pioneer of using graphics. Um, and so this is like um, a chart of the exports and imports uh, to and from Denmark and Norway uh, from 1700 to 1780. So this is like a line chart essentially. Um, how um, is the exports and uh, imports um, to Denmark and Norway combined from England? And you can see that like, first we have a balance against England and then after 1755 uh, roughly there is a balance in favor of England. He also created one of the first known pie charts here, the Turkish Empire, which portion of the Turkish, Turkish Empire is in European, so, uh, uh, European uh, soil, which is an, an Asian soil, and which is an African soil. Um, then people started to use visualizations to communicate pattern, <coughs> patterns. So this is the, I don't have to look at my notes quickly. This is the Broad Street Cholera outbreak in London. Um, so cholera, at this time, this was 1854, people didn't know anything about bacteria, they didn't know how cholera was transmitted. Uh, so the general, the general theory back then was that it is um, based on an airborne, like the bad air essentially. And the one physician, Jon Snow, not from Game of Thrones, <laughs> um, actually believed um, that it's water that's causing that. And so he collected data, and to collect the data from where um, these cases of cholera occurred, and then he did like he plotted them on this map, and like each black line here is a case of cholera. And you can see that in this area here, there's a lot of those black lines. Out here, there's not so many. And then he also showed the water pumps in here. Uh, and so this is one water pump, and you can see that all the people living in proximity of this water pump, like there's a lot of cases that get sick here. And there's another water pump. People that would rather go to get water from this water pump didn't get sick. So he had the hypothesis that this water pump was actually causing the disease and by using this data and communicating it to the authorities, he actually got them to remove the handle from the water pump and thereby help getting this cholera epidemic under control. And this is like a famous story, of course. Uh, there's books about it, um, so you can uh, take a look at this if you're more interested. So if you like, have ever seen anything historic about data visualization, you might have seen this chart. Uh, this is uh, a, a, chart, a chart by Minard, uh, a French cartographer, um, and so he, this depicts um, Napoleon's march on Moscow. So the size of this thing here uh, depicts the size of the uh, French army that was marching towards Moscow. Uh, and every time this, uh, here you can see, a part of the army splits off, goes into a different direction, and therefore the size of this, um, of this river here gets thinner. And here we have another split and so on. And you can see that this continuously uh, gets smaller and smaller over time. And it turns out uh, it was like a very difficult travel at this time. And so a lot of soldiers actually died uh, even going there. And then you can see in Moscow the actual battle or the actual siege barely like these two things are almost the same. Like this is going towards it, this is going back from it. Um, and so the siege actually barely cost any lives. It was more like the movement towards there. And then, um, going like retreating in the winter, um, here is also plotted the temperature. And it was a really brutal and cold winter. And you can see that there is a couple of um, um, like things that happen. I don't know the details exactly, but here at this river crossing, uh, about half of the people uh, that were still in this army died just because of crossing this river in the winter. So like, this is like an impressive chart, it's often considered to be like, a very inspirational chart. This is what we should strive for, like, integrating so much information into such a vivid picture uh, as visualization designers. Um, and so like, we have different choices when we visualize data. Here is an early subway map from 1927, and this is from London. Uh, so you can see they already had a pretty established subway by then, uh, but it's all pretty cluttered. And so people have thought about how can we pre represent this differently? Um, 
And so, um, like, this is like one way of like abstracting this information. This is really just about showing where do the lines go, how do they intersect, but or mostly ignoring the spatial relationships. Like here, it's all about making labels readable uh, and making it easy to see where I can change from one line to the other. But you don't have too much geographic context anymore. And this is a modern New York City subway map. So you can see that um, it doesn't look like generally uh, people appreciated this too much and, and people have gone back to this more spatially original uh, representation. And still, these subway maps, they don't claim to be like really accurate in terms of where the lines go. It's really about where are the stations, where can, do, where can you do interchanges. Um, here's a different representation. This is a Boston metro system. Uh, and this shows you like roughly some geography. So here's the Charles River, here's the sea. Um, but what it does is it also shows you a radial layout of time. So you can see, or you probably can, but this here is the five minute radius. So you can get essentially from the center to here within five minutes, to here within 10 minutes, to here within 15 minutes. So here, the distance on this chart doesn't represent the like, distance on, uh, on the map, but it represents the time that you travel. And you are free to do these kind of encodings if you like. Um, historical in terms of computers, I think what I really would like to uh, show you is interaction techniques, early interaction techniques. And these are two favorite videos of mine. This one is of uh, Ivan Sutherland, and then we have this, the mother of all demos by Douglas Engelbart. Ivan Sutherland actually was a professor at Utah for some time. So let's take a look at this. Into the computer, we have to draw some out of this display. And we use the light pen. Well, in order to construct a meaningful engineering drawing, we have to have several graphical manipulations. Ivan Sutherland's programs can draw straight lines and circles. Well, that's about what you do in the drafting equipment anyway, isn't it? Yeah, very good. In order to do this, we can position this white spot in the middle, middle of the cross, if you notice, at a desired location. And we press the button to command the computer to draw a line. It will draw a line from this position where I am now to any subsequent position of my light pen. This is much like a rubber band stuck in two pins. One is nailed on the, on the, the screen here, and the other is at my light pen. So I can position this anywhere I want. Now. I lost track of there. I didn't move the pen too fast. And that told the computer to stop drawing the line. Well, if you notice, that bright dot will jump onto the line as I get close to it. Well, the dot in the center of the cross, when you get close to it, it jumps over onto it. Correct. Why did it do that? It's much like a gravity field at the end point. It's even a higher gravity field. It allows us to position the point exactly on the line, or in this case, exactly at the end point. This allows me to move my pen quite coarsely. Be sloppy while I'm drawing mm -hmm. and get a big precision drawing up at the same time. So now I'm going to draw a second line. And even the third one. Now, in an ordinary uh, pencil and paper drawing, all we have is this particular picture. But the computer understands the geometry of the drawing here. What do I mean? I mean that if I point at this particular point and tell the computer to move that point by another push button command, it will move not only that point, but all three lines that are attached to it. And the delay between it's doing it. So this was, of course, revolutionary back then and nowadays. Like we, we kind of assumed this kind of technology. Um, and the other video introduces user interface devices for the first time that we are completely so accustomed to not to help you keep track of where we are, and a little bit This demo actually introduced video conferencing, hypertext, and a couple of user interface paradigms. I'd like to come in now and begin to tell you something about the implementation. So I'm going to open up under here and talk to you about the control techniques. This is a hierarchical menu for hierarchical navigation. control language. Okay, to talk about control devices, we'll use this overhead camera shot. Well, you can see the devices that I'm using. I use three, and they're not all standard. We have a pointing device called our mouse, a standard keyboard, and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up. That'll show you 
from another point of view, more about how that mouse works. Come in Menlo Park. Okay, there's Don Andrews' hand, Menlo Park. And in a second we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way and we never did change it. <laughs> All right. As it moves up or down or sideways, so is the tracking spot. And the, the principles for its operation are quite easy to see. You'll turn it over, Don. Can you hear me, Don? When you turn it over, we'll see, right? Its principle is that there are two wheels that roll on the surface. But since they're right angles and... So, I, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, this is like a one hour, 40 minute demo. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to show everything now. Uh, but this is like where, where interactive computing really began and where, where the foundations of what we can do now uh, happened. So here's a couple of modern <coughs> examples. Um, this is what's called the baby name wizard. Um, so for example, like this shows me the popularity of baby names um, over time. So this goes back to the 8080s and we're, it's like blue for boys and pink for girls, of course. Uh, and so we can select, I want to show only the boys, and you can see that John, for example, was a very popular name in the 8080s. And we can click on John, and then we can see, okay, it was like really, really popular. Uh, per million births, 35,000 people were named John. And then it decreased over time, and nowadays it's not very popular anymore. It's still in the top 50, uh, or in the top 30 even, uh, but it's not number one anymore. So we can delete this, and we can look for my name, for example. Uh, Alexander, <laughs> and like I was born in 1980, like right around the peak when this was a popular name. Anybody else want to try his or her name? Dylan. Dylan. Dylan essentially started in the 80s. There was barely anything uh, <laughs> in the 1930s. Anybody else? Jacob. Jacob. What do you think? Very, very popular. <laughs> oh, I wrote it. Is it right, right? Jacob. Well, there's different. Oh, well, Jacob. Yeah, Jacob is popular, but uh, 1990s was number five. So I would guess you were born in the latter, latter part of the 80s. Uh, 93. 93, okay. Yeah, like right at the, at the peak of this, uh, of this chart. <laughs> It is, it is like uh, terrible to see how one's parents <laughs> <laughs> So go ahead and play with this. This is actually done by Martin Wattenberg, a famous visualization researcher, and his wife uh, also published a book about baby names that people buy now to pick baby names and understand the history, and so you can go there and buy that if you're expecting. Communication, like this is a video that I simply have to show. Um, Hans Rosling is a, is a public health researcher um, in um, Sweden, Stockholm, um, and he gives just amazing talks. His, his um, mission is, is essentially to inform uh, people about global public health. And so he is just a great communicator and visual, uses, uses visual means to do that. About 10 years ago, I took on the task to teach global development to Swedish undergraduate students. <laughs> That was after having spent about 20 years together with African institutions studying hunger in Africa. So I was sort of expected to know a little about the world. And I started in our medical university, Karolinska Institute, an undergraduate course called Global Health. But when you get that opportunity, you get a little nervous. I thought, these students coming to us actually have the highest grade you can get in Swedish college system. So I thought, maybe they know everything I'm going to teach them about. So I did a pre-test when they came. And one of the questions from which I learned a lot was this one. Which country has the highest child mortality of these five pairs? And I put them together so that in each pair of country, one has twice the child mortality of the other. And this means that um, it's much bigger the difference than the uncertainty of the data. I won't put you at a test here, but it's Turkey, which is highest there, Poland, Russia, Pakistan, and South Africa. And these were the results of the Swedish students. I did this, so I got the confidence interval, which was pretty narrow, and I got happy, of course. I won 0.8 right answer out of five possible. That means that there was a place for a professor of international health and for my course. 
But one night, late night, when I was compiling the report, I really realized my discovery. I have shown that Swedish top students know statistically significantly less about the world than the chimpanzees. <laughs> because the chimpanzee would score half right. If I gave them two bananas with Sri Lanka and Turkey, they would be right, half of the cases. But the students are not there. The problem for me was not ignorance, it was preconceived ideas. I did also an unfair, unethical study of the professors of the Karolinska Institute <laughs> that hands out the Nobel Prize in medicine and they are on par with the chimpanzee there. <laughs> so this is where I realized that there was really a need to communicate because the data of what's happening in the world and the child health of every country is very well aware. So we did the software which displays it like this. Every bubble here is a country. Uh, this country over here is, um, uh, this is uh, China. And this is India. The size of the bubble is the population. And on this axis here, I put fertility rate. Because my students, what they said when they looked upon the world, and I asked them, what do you really think about the world? Huh? Well, I first discovered that the textbook was Tintin mainly. Eh? And they said the world is still we and them. And we is Western world, and them is third world. And what do you mean with Western world, I said. Well, that's long life and small family. And third world is short life and large family. So this is what I could display here. I put fertility rate here, number of children per woman, one, two, three, four, up to about eight children per woman. We have very good data since 1962, 1960 about, on the size of families in all countries. The error margin is narrow. Here I put life expectancy at birth, from 30 years in some countries up to about 70 years. And 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries, they had large families, and they had relatively short lives. Now what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries? Or have these developing countries got smaller families and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we stop the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go, can you see there? It's China, they're moving against better health, they're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. The yellow ones here are the Arabic countries and they get larger families, but they, no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here, they still remain here. This is India, Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh, it's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The Imams start to promote family planning, and they move up into that corner, and in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries, and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family, and we have a completely new world. <laughs> Let me make a compare. So this is how I expect you guys to present your project. <laughs> Data visualization is also about humans. Uh, not everything that we can draw can be perceived. So here are uh, two charts to visualize uh, the big genome, genome interaction network and the big Facebook network. And those are useless charts. They're cool. like, you can render them, you can compute the deterministic positions, but there's nothing that you can learn from them other than that it's like a big network and it looks impressive. So we have to think about what, are the, what can humans perceive uh, what does what makes sense for humans to render, and there is like there are really hard limits to our cognition, and not only like this if we see too many things on top of each other, but there is way more subtle things, and we'll have a, like a couple of lectures on perception, on color, vision, and so on. But here's a good example um, of one guy asking for directions, um, and you see that this the white guy is giving him directions and is like very um, engaged and explaining where to go. <laughs> and he's so like, completely uh, immersed in, in his like telling people where to go that he doesn't even notice that he's suddenly talking to talking to a different person. What does it mean for interfaces? It means don't be subtle with your changes. Like 
you have like a limited attention budget from your users. So we'll study these kind of things too. Okay, so this was my introduction to visualization. Now I'll talk a little bit about the logistics of this class. Uh, first, uh, like you know my name, uh, but I also thought I would like to introduce myself a little more. I'm an assistant professor here at Computer Science in my second year. Before I came here, I was a postdoc and a lecturer at Harvard for three years. I got my PhD in 2012 from uh, Austria. I am from Austria and Europe from Graz University of Technology. This is a picture that I took in, uh, on a hike the year before I left. Uh, so you can see where we have great mountains, and I feel right at home here in Salt Lake City because of that. Um, I am running, together with Mariah Meyer, uh, the Visualization Design Lab. And these are our PhD and master students. Uh, if you want to learn more about us, you can go to vdl.sci.utah.edu. Uh, all of us work in developing novel visualization interfaces uh, and studying how we can create better interfaces and finding new solutions to uh, interesting biological problems to other application areas. Um, we, we think about theoretical visualization of graphs and so on. Um, we all are part also of the uh, uh, Ski Institute and like as many of you have heard of the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute and like we have these, these mission fields essentially with scientific computing, biomedical computing, scientific visualization, information visualization, so those two together, visualization and image analysis and so Ski has about 15 or 16 faculty, and you can see their faces here. It's not quite up to date, but most of them, um, most of the faculty are, are on this picture. Uh, Ski also has a website, so you can like, go there if you like. Um, in my research, um, I do research on, for example, large multivariate biological networks. So I think about how can I make these gigantic hairballs a little bit more accessible. Um, so very often it's based on on queries, on like understanding user intent, on providing context. So here, for example, I'm showing like a co-author network between uh, two authors in visualization, and then listing all the paths that they're connected. So instead of showing one big hairball, this is like a ranked list of paths, and you can define different attributes to change these rankings. Um, up here is like a biological network where we show where I show like uh, like very large numbers of associated data, but we'll talk about these things later. I also work in multidimensional data analysis, so for example, this is the solution to the banana Venn diagram here. Um, we will talk about this um, in, in, in the lecture on tabular data, or here we have multivariate rankings where, where we investigate it, for example, um, like if you have a ranking of universities, there's so many factors going into them, how do you combine them, how do you judge what is really important. And this tool is meant to essentially democratize the process, to give you this tool, and you can say, okay, as a student, I'm more interested in a high faculty-student ratio than in a good number of citations per faculty, for example. And then I worked in genomic data. I'm not, like I talked about this tool. Um, um, there is another tool for alternative splicing, mRNA-seq, but I'm not going to go into detail about this. Um, in the tail end of this lecture, we will have four guest lectures by Aaron Knoll. Aaron Knoll is a colleague of mine at the Ski Institute. Um, he is their research scientist there, and he's an expert for spatial data. So he will talk to you about volume visualization, about uh, surfaces, about flows, uh, and of, about tensors, and so on. And he um, did a postdoc at Kaiserslautern and then at Argonne National Lab before uh, coming to Utah. Uh, we also have our course staff. Would you guys please stand up? Uh, so we have Carolina Nobre, Yogesh Mishra, and Vinita Yaski as our TAs. Um, these guys will be the ones that, that will help you if you, if you run into trouble with your homeworks or uh, with have you, any other technical questions. They will be holding office hours and they will also be grading uh, your assignments. I guess, like many of you have been in this situation before, so you know how it works. So um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. So, Raise your hand if, if the question fits you. Like, who is the, for whom is the first year in, in, at, the, at the U? Okay, quite a bit. So, welcome everybody. Um, for who who is in a master's program? Who is in a PhD program? Who is on the grad? Who is in computer science? Majority. Who is in other engineering fields? Okay. Who is in the sciences? Any social scientists? One. Great. Business? Did you miss anybody? Yeah, I'm just doing the data, data science. Okay, yeah, the data track. Uh, who's in the data, uh, data science uh, and the data certificate? Okay, cool. 
who has considers themselves um, to be like a good programmer? <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> who has programmed in Python before? Who has programmed in JavaScript before? Okay. C++? C and C++ and Java, I guess. Okay, so you guys know quite a bit already. Great. Um, so a little bit about the structure and the goals. Like, really, like, this is my goal statement. What I would like you to learn is how to efficiently visualize data. And there's a couple of parts to that. So first, we will be doing a lot in evaluating and critiquing. Like, visualization isn't, um, like, it's not like algorithms. We don't, we cannot prove things, right? There is no right or wrong answer. There's just, like, answers that are satisfying. Um, so it's, it's like there is a lot of design component and I notice that classical computer scientists that are trained in okay I want to like calculate the runtime complexity of this algorithm um, don't really feel comfortable with this idea of not having exact answers so we will do a lot of what for example architects or artists do we'll do design critiques like basically every lecture that I'm <coughs> teaching I'll hand out something and we will discuss whether this is a good design or a bad design and what makes it a good design or what makes it a bad design there is a theory of visualization. There's fundamental principles. We know that certain things work and certain don't, and I will teach you this, how to do this. Um, and then, it's not just about the basic visual encoding, it's about designing like a solution, a bigger product, a visual analysis solution. And as a side effect, you will learn how to develop for the web in this course. Uh, so we will be uh, doing HTML, JavaScript, D3, CSS, and so on in this course. Um, and this will be like, Essentially, your homework and your project will be very like you will code it quite a bit. I really want you to think about the design aspect and developing like sketches and, and developing visualization solutions too. Students tend in this course I've taught it a couple of times now tend to get hung up in the nitty gritty details of getting this to work in JavaScript. I'll try to emphasize um, how important it is to really have a good design in the first place. Um, so there's a couple of components. Uh, in this course, there's lectures that introduce theory, and we'll have these design critiques, which I just mentioned. Uh, we will have labs, which are essentially coding <coughs> tutorials, and these will be heavily front-loaded. So I will start teaching technical stuff, how to do JavaScript, how to do D3, in the next couple of lectures. So if you consider yourself to be like a decent web developer, you might not be super interested in the next lecture. I really want to uh, like not everybody here is a great programmer, as we have seen. Uh, I really want to make this course accessible to like a broad audience. So if you come uh, on Thursday, I will be talking about HTML. If you're bored by what is the DOM, what is HTML, and if you know how to write um, JavaScript code, you don't have to come. Uh, I don't really want to bore you, you, but I also want everybody to have a fair chance to do well in this course. Uh, and then we will have homeworks and the final projects. And the homeworks are really there to help you specific skills, uh, help you develop specific skills, and mostly coding skills. So we will first like, let you do something with SVG, then do you something with D3 JavaScript, and then we'll think about how do we structure a bigger project, how do we communicate, how do we compartmentalize, and so on. Um, and the final project is really where, you, where your design skill will be able to shine. So you will pick your own data set, uh, you will work in a team, and you will develop a visualization product, uh, a complete this project. So this course will essentially be um, like these three concepts will flow into each other. We have the theory uh, that I will be teaching in lectures, we have the coding skills that I will be teaching in labs, and then we have the design skills that we will essentially like implicitly train in, in these design studios, in these design critiques. Okay, so you can see the schedule here. Um, the course is structured in four parts. There's like first is the technical foundations part. So this is like the, we start with HTML, then JavaScript, and then we start in going into this D3, this data-driven documents library that we'll be using for our projects. Um, and then after we have covered the technical stuff, we'll go into the visualization fundamentals. So I will talk about uh, perception, about visual encodings, what, what different types of data are there, uh, design guidelines, what is like like simple rules that you can follow that make you a better visualization designer, what are like visualization tasks, and so on. And then in the third part of this course, we will go into abstract data visualization. So we will talk about how can we encode things like big networks, or tables, or sets, or maps. 
And then finally, we will have uh, uh, a section on spatial data visualization where we talk about volume, surfaces, flow. Um, so you can go to the website. Uh, the schedule is there. Also, with the various deadlines that are shown in the schedule. And there's also the canvas uh, where all of the major times are added to the calendar. So this is the website. You, like, it is kind of your first stop for everything that is related to this course. Uh, you can see the syllabus here. And I would really like ask you to read this. Um, and to make sure that you understand all of the um, like concepts in this course, how we, how we run the logistics. Um, the schedule <coughs> the schedule also con contains um, links to, um, to the various um, tutorials that we will start with. So we'll start, like I'll start introducing, for example, next lecture version control of Git, because I think it's important. Um, and you will also have to use it in your project. Yes? Uh, for Git, is... Uh uh, that is correct. So what does Git mean? Uh, for the projects. Oh, okay. So you can yeah. share between teams. Exactly. So up, like the previous iteration of this course, I did everything in GitHub. Uh, this year, we have decided to switch to Canvas. It's a trial. We will try it out. We like usually it worked great with Git uh, and GitHub. We had a couple of cases where people published their homeworks in it like unknowingly. Um, so we're trying this now with, uh, with Canvas. I still think it's important for computer scientists and engineers to understand how version control works and you will need it in your projects. Uh, there's like a couple of features. I'll talk about this more on Thursday. Um, and so there's links to these tutorials here and they're actually interactive. So like, you can, uh, well, the HTML parts are interactive. So you can actually like play along with this and then this will actually update. So, the way it will work is I will go through these examples and we'll, uh, I'll do some live coding and, and show you uh, how this works. Um, so for communication, I would like to ask you to talk about anything that is like, for example, uh, if you get hung up on, a, on some problem with your code, I would like to ask you to use either Canvas or to use the, uh, the office hours. Please don't email me with my code doesn't compile or I can not get this back. Like this is a big class. I'm happy to help, but I, I, I want to help where it's also helpful to others. I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to um, look at your code individually and like find your solution and debug it via email. So if you have any problems like this, go to office hours or post on Canvas. Don't post complete solutions to Canvas. It's obvious, but I'm still saying it. Um, I have office hours um, every Thursday after class in my office. I'm in Warnock Engineering Building in this building in 3887, so you're welcome to stop by on announcing these office hours. Um, and the TAs will have office hours where they can help you with homeworks and coding questions and so on starting next week. Um, and you can email me at alex.sci.utah.edu, but please use this email for personal things, like if you're not feeling well, you cannot come to a um, lecture, or well, you don't have to say that to me, but you cannot come to an exam, or, or you cannot make the homework deadline, or anything else like that. Something personal, always email me, always come to me, ask questions. I'm happy to help. Um, there's two required books. Um, this one is kind of the theory. It is pretty dense reading, but it is a good book. So if you're interested in visualization beyond just getting a grade in this course, I would really strongly recommend that you buy and read this book. Um, this one here is a technical introduction. Um, so this is about D3. It's also available for free uh, online through the Safari library. There's a link to it um, on the course website on the syllabus. Um, one caveat, um, this book is written for D3, D3 version 3 and we'll be using the latest version, version 4, so there will be some minor differences. I will hint at them uh, in the next couple of lectures. I already mentioned that we will be programming in HTML5. Uh, we will use JavaScript um, and we will use this library, which is like really amazing. It has changed the way how visualization is done on the web, the data-driven documents. Okay, so you might ask yourself, am I in the right course? Is this really, um, am I, will I be able to survive this? Or is this going to be way too boring for me? Um, so you're expected to have programming experience, and I thought that most of you have, so you should be fine. Uh, you don't have to know about JavaScript. I will be teaching you that. So if you haven't done JavaScript, that's fine. Um, you have to, you'll have to have a willingness to learn new software and tools. So as like any engineering, this is like especially coding, um, you learn coding by doing it. 
and that's why we have homeworks, that's why we have projects. Uh, you will fail and you will make it you will notice why you're failing and you will get better at it. Um, and there is like a, a suite of tools that we will be using um, to do these kinds of things. Um, so really, um, you will need to build these skills also by yourself. You cannot completely rely uh, on, on me teaching you everything. You will also have to find, like, find solutions to problems that you run into. Okay, a couple of formalities. Um, how are you graded? Um, we will have seven different homework assignments that make up a total of 40% of the grades. The value of these homework assignments varies depending on their difficulty and their effort. So the first ones are going to be less uh, and the later ones are going to be higher in percentages. I would recommend that you start early. Like if you haven't worked with D3 or JavaScript, it can be a little tricky. So if you start three hours before the deadline, it's not sure that you'll actually finish. Um, you could definitely if you know what you're doing exactly, but I just like, really don't want anybody to, um, to be surprised if something doesn't work quite out. Um, the due date is always on Fridays, um, at least for now. Um, there will be late days, so if you cannot get an assignment in on Friday night, um, you can submit it on Saturday. You will, uh, there will, we will deduct 10% of the point per points per day, so that can be like a uh, valuable, like if you basically have 50% working, uh, it might make sense to submit on Saturday. Um, and so you can use up to two of those late days, um, and so you have to submit by Sunday night. And then we will release solutions to all of our homeworks early in the week so that you can look at it and find like, okay, did I do this right? And that you can essentially be informed about how to do things better for the next homework. Um, the final project is 40% of your grade. Um, it's done in teams of two or three. We will, we will make the rare exceptions for that. So if you really have like your narrow data set that nobody else understands because you're the uh, biochemist that it works exactly with this data set, we might make an exception that you may work by yourself, but generally it's teamwork. Um, we will have two milestones. The first one is going to be less important, but it's, it's, it's designed so we can essentially give you feedback. So first you will propose your project in one of the homeworks, then you will have a milestone submission that will be 10% of your overall grade, and then you'll have your final submission that will be 30% of your overall grade. So the final project is pretty important. And then we'll have two exams uh, in the last week before the fall break and in the last week before exam period is actually midterms. Um, they're not like high value, 10% each, um, but they're essentially here to see whether you kind of paid attention on the theory. Um, as you all probably know, the School of Computing is the very, very uh, strict on cheating. It's actually the department with the strictest cheating policy in the whole university. So if you get caught cheating, you fail the course. So if you copy code, if you get caught, caught cheating in two courses and you fail those two courses because of it, you're out of the program. Um, I'm not expecting this to happen, I just want to be explicit that we automatically check um, your submissions to, for similarities to each other, for similarities to any other homework that we have ever collected, and for resources on the internet. So please, if you use code, you, like software engineering nowadays is, work, you work by examples, you look on Stack Overflow, you look on other examples on the web, this is totally fine um, if they're like, you don't copy them and also put references to them in your code. That's essentially what I'm asking you to do. And you're also welcome to discuss problems, uh, to show your code to your colleagues and to ask them, can you help me? <coughs> we, we, we want you to interact with each other, but you cannot copy code verbatim and you cannot look at it and type exactly the same thing. Um, and this is like really, really uh, a problem. Like if that happens, it's really uncomfortable for us. It's really uncomfortable for you. It's just a terrible situation, so I would ask you simply to not even get us into this situation. I haven't had problems in the past before, but we have had a couple of issues in the department, so um, we, we have been asked uh, to make this very clear. Um, so one other thing that I want to tell you about, I'm not going to enforce this, but I would suggest that you don't use your devices while you're in class here. Um, the thing is that I try to do like an engaging and entertaining lecture, but I cannot compete to your buddy texting you on Facebook. Um, there is like this red light in your peripheral vision um, blinking and it's gonna grab your attention even if it's super boring and you're gonna be distracted. And there's a lot of studies that show A, note taking per hand is more efficient uh, and B, like if you have a device like your phone uh, in front of you, if you have your computer open, your Facebook feed open, your Twitter open, 
you're simply not going to retain as much. And if you're in this lecture, you don't have to come. I, I appreciate it if you come. I really like, like to run an interactive classroom. Uh, but you don't have to come. Nobody is forcing you to. And if you come, please do pay attention. Um, and one way of doing this uh, that makes it easier for you is to simply put away your devices. Of course, in the coding lectures, you're actually encouraged to bring your devices and to code along, to try things out. So that doesn't apply. This only applies to the theoretic lectures. Okay, this week um, there is a homework zero due, which is not graded. This is basically an introduction and some setting, uh, some setup stuff. Uh, we will ask you to get uh, free GitHub repositories for your project. This sometimes can take a while. I think GitHub has gotten better, but um, it's still um, good to do this early. Uh, there is a reading for this week. Um, <laughs> The D3 book, uh, chapters 1 to 3, so you should go through that, and the uh, visualization design and analysis book, chapter 1. Um, next week, there's the first real homework due. Uh, homework 1 is going to be pretty simple, it's just doing some SVG elements. Um, and then we will talk more about technical foundations, about JavaScript, what is JSON, what is D3, and we will start holding office hours. And um, the homeworks are published on GitHub. Um, so you can go there um, to this website and see the homeworks and you can see homework 0 and homework 1 is published. Here is an in in instruction on how to clone that. I guess m many of you have seen that and if you, if you don't know how to do this you will learn it in the first lecture on, or in the first coding lecture on Thursday. So here is homework 1 and so in homework 1 you will essentially build uh, SVGs that represent this data here. Um, so take a look at this um, and so that's the end of my lecture. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. If not, you can also come out personally to me and talk about any organizational stuff. Thank you. Uh, the video is on YouTube.